Wi-Fi 7 is finally here. It's the ECW 520, the 2x2x2. Two two two. But the real question is, Wi-Fi 7, should you care? Is it time to care yet? I mean, Wi-Fi 7's been out for a while, but has it? I've been running the ingenious Wi-Fi 6E access points at home for about a year now, a little over. And my experience with those continues to be that they're rock solid, reliable, seamless client roaming, no headaches, fast, a lot of stuff. So when Ingenius rolled out their first Wi-Fi 7 line, I knew I had to try them. So I pinged them and they said, yeah, we'll send you some to try. There's, there's, there's some landmines, but we're gonna talk about it. $190 access point at the time that I'm doing this video, uh, global economic situation notwithstanding. <laughs> Affordable, kinda, but with Wi-Fi 7, Wi-Fi 7 overall is gonna cost more than Wi-Fi 6E. And this is the first Wi-Fi 7 device I've tested that is toward, not quite, something enterprise, enterprise-ish. Metal, heat sink, heavy. I'm not looking for Wi-Fi jank, hence why I try to only buy business grade stuff. But companies notice that, and then they start slapping business grade on everything, and then it's like, which thing is actually business grade? It's subtle, but this is more like ingenious dipping their toes into Wi-Fi 7 at the commercial-ish level. Definitely better than consumer grade, but there's some caveats with Wi-Fi 7 overall. So we're gonna talk about the good and the bad and why this makes sense, and by the way, it, it runs hot. Really, really hot. Uh, but even under my torture testing, I haven't had any stability issues, at least not yet. But I haven't gotten a lot of mileage on it yet. So I'm gonna be putting it through a few more weeks of tests. And I've also got a follow-up video that I'm planning with the 4x4x4 ECW536. That has a 10 gigabit uplink. So look for that if you want your stability report follow-up. Other videos on this channel and you know, long-term, we do that. Now before we get too deep into specs, I wanna explain why I don't bother with consumer Wi-Fi gear anymore. Most consumer or even prosumer access points and you know combination access point routers are unreliable because they're trying to do too much with too little hardware. They reinvent the wheel and they reinvent the wheel badly. I, I mean, I could quip about it. That, oh, look at us, we've concocted a new real-time operating system that fits in just four gigabytes of memory and it's very difficult to upgrade and it's very you know, magical and all this other kind of stuff, but oh, why, did, why did you do that? Modern enterprise stuff is usually like a PC control plane that has Docker containers that are manipulating the underlying chipset. And I'd rather have something kind of like that, kind of enterprise-ish, you know, Linux, and containerized chipset control, that's how you get long-term reliability. You don't reinvent the enterprise wheel. You're just gonna have to deal with something that complicated. And in my testing, this Ingenious AP is something toward that. It's not an all plastic, all-in-one router. It's, it's built with a commercial mindset, but it's a two by two by two configuration. But that still can be really good for people that are enthusiasts. So let's talk a little bit about the Wi-Fi standards even before we talk about the product, because the understanding that is also important. What makes Wi-Fi 7 different from Wi-Fi 6E? Wi-Fi 6E gave us access to the clean six gigahertz band and 160 megahertz wide channels. Wi-Fi 7 takes that further with 320 megahertz channels. Double the width, double the potential throughput. Wider the channel, more room for bits. But here's the catch. Not all clients support that. Some Intel BE200 and AMD RZ chipsets do actually support the full 320 megahertz, but not all. Early Wi-Fi 7 clients, sometimes this is just a driver issue, only go up to 160 megahertz. That's kind of important, and it's kind of important to understand that. There's a lot of things out there that are labeled Wi-Fi 7 that cannot actually do that 320 megahertz max speed channel width. And in your environment, you might not physically be able to do 320 megahertz channel width because of external interference, other Wi-Fi stuff you got going on, your neighbors, whatever. You're gonna have to experiment with it. Rule versus urban. That's gonna make a difference as well. You gotta, you gotta do the experimentation. But we got other features too. Uh, 4096 quadrature, quadrature amplitude modulation QAM. Basically, we're cramming in more bits per signal. It boosts throughput, but that also shrinks your effective range. And the killer feature here, multi-link operation, MLO. That lets a device use multiple radios, say, five gigahertz and six gigahertz simultaneously, that's what I recommend to try to shoot for, for higher reliability, uh, smoother roaming, and more throughput. That is the big thing, probably the biggest thing that makes Wi-Fi 7 start to feel robust and reliable. But the client side software there is just as important as your back end. And there's also mesh, and it's like, okay, mesh, mesh AP, full mesh, higher throughput, 
comes at the expense of range and the complexity of all this also tends to introduce some instability. And that's why Wi-Fi 7 adoption in the enterprise has been slow. You don't just buy a few APs for a lot of clients and range anymore. You need specific APs for density and even more APs for range because the density, <laughs> it's, they're related. So Ingenius has three Wi-Fi 7 products right now, the ECW520, that's this one, two by two by two, about 190 US, as I said, the time that I'm doing this video. The ECW536, four by four by four with a 10 gig backhaul, and I'm gonna review that in a couple of weeks. They also have an outdoor option. We'll see if I decide on that. Outdoors, I'm thinking Wi-Fi 6E is still the thing that makes the most sense, even if Wi-Fi 7 is working as advertised. So the ECW520 is their least expensive Wi-Fi 7 access point, and it's still cloud managed, and it still has the DNA of enterprise gear. So think of it as toe in the water. That's why I say toe in the water, commercial Wi-Fi 7. But it's the thing that makes sense for power users like me. So let's talk more about the actual specs. Tri-band, 2.4 gigahertz, five gigahertz, and six gigahertz. With those frequencies, you can top out at like 6.8 gigabit. But here's the thing, this has two and a half gig uplink. 60 watt PoE, also known as 802.3 BT is recommended. So if your switch only does 30 watts, 802.3 AT, uh, maybe check your infrastructure. You need to be able to do your upgrade, that kind of thing. But it does support multiple VLANs, multiple SSIDs, uh, AP, AP mesh, and mesh only. Mesh only maybe could make sense for connecting a detached workshop. So you can set these up, you know, just hang this off the side of your shed, and then it can mesh with another access point without actually having a physical wired ethernet port to the rest of your network. There are other specialty products that do that kind of thing though. And I think those would work better for that use case but maybe it makes sense. And maybe if you have a use case where mesh or AP mesh mode would make sense for how you wanna use it, uh, hit me up in the forum, cause I wanna, I wanna hear about that. But the main reason I'm excited about Wi-Fi 7 is that it has better roaming and better throughput. With Wi-Fi 7, you're gonna deploy more access points and more access points naturally means you're gonna have more handoffs and there's gonna be different devices paired to different access points. Those handoffs had better be robust. So I tested this with Intel's BE200, AMD's new RZ chipset, our Flow Z13 here with Strix Halo running Linux, and the firmware on that has historically been a mess, but ro ro roaming now is smoother on this. Also 802.11R and 802.11K, those are the standards that can help, you know, the AP pre-negotiate and guide the client to the proper radio. That means when you're walking around on a Teams or a Zoom call that you're not gonna get those hiccups or frozen frames. This can also be helpful with, uh, uh, you know, your multi-link because one of the two links in multi-link is gonna do the handoff independently. So you never really truly lose the connection even for a millisecond when you uh, are hopping between nodes in multi-link mode. Now, WPA, there's some caveats with that as well that I found in testing. Some roaming features are only fully supported under WPA2 Enterprise. WPA3 support is improving, but not all clients handle that cleanly yet. There's also a WPA2, WPA3 hybrid mode, which Ingenious supports, and that works well generally. Okay, and you know, there's also the throughput question. You know, theoretically, not all clients can do 320 megahertz. Many are still limited to 160 megahertz. My out-of-the-box benchmarks were actually worse with this than my finely tuned Wi-Fi 6E setup. I was getting around 700 megabit on Wi-Fi 7 compared to 1.1 gigabit on Wi-Fi 6E. But after updates and fiddling around with the connection, the Wi-Fi 7 caught up. And by the way, those Wi-Fi 6E access points, those are the expensive four by four solutions. They cost about $600 each. So even if I pick up two of these, I'm still at less overall cost. Density is another story. With the two by two radio, this is gonna be fine for home and small office, but probably not a classroom. It's, you know, realistically, I'd say you're gonna get about five to seven clients at 320 megahertz or 10 to 15 at 160 megahertz before things start to get sketchy. And you gotta remember this uplink, Again, two and a half gigabit. That's gonna bottleneck before the radios hit their theoretical max. That's why I said earlier, with Wi-Fi 7, more is more. You'll want more access points and you'll want more access to uh, points depo deployed closer to get the full Wi-Fi 7 experience. And one thing I have to call out, again, heat. Under heavy load, running continuously, this little box runs warm. Uh, it, the, this back is metal and it can heat soak for about 30 to 45 minutes. But I would not put this in direct sunlight or in an attic without climate control. For a home deployment, I'd recommend spots like 
putting it in a living room or a family room where most of your clients are gonna be, maybe the kitchen, if you hang out in the kitchen, basically keep it indoors in indoor condition. And if you can, line of sight to where most of the clients are gonna be. It's gonna work a lot better in those scenarios. The management of this is really easy. It's managed through Ingenious Cloud. You gotta take it out of the box, scan a QR code, enroll it. You can do all of it from your mobile phone. The best part of this is there's no subscription required. It's kind of a freemium model. There are pro features you can subscribe to, but basic cloud management and all that kind of stuff is free. And once its configuration is on here, it really only checks periodically and at startup and the management and all that kind of stuff happens here. It's not really super cloud dependent because I can block it with my firewall and everything basically keeps working. If that changes in the future or they start you know, locking down the cloud, don't worry, I'll be the first to uh, come screeching from the rafters. But so far, I've been really impressed with this. Also in the box comes with a wall mount kit as well as a drop ceiling mount kit. So you can just snap it directly to the metal rails that are in a typical drop ceiling in an office type space. Or you can just screw it into your ceiling and it'll be fine. Now something curious we ran into and you'll probably run into is the default out of the box channel width is pretty conservative and there's not really a way to change it from the mobile app or I'm completely blind and I couldn't figure it out. Also can figure it out in the desktop app. Like if you just edit the SSID, normally the settings, you, you, you make the network settings what you want and then the access points you add to the network inherit the settings. That all works fine. Did not work fine for the channel width. I ended up having to override that in the selection here in this part of the screen. So. Uh, probably that'll be fixed by the time you're watching this, but it was odd. And one suggestion that I might make for Linux is if you're using NMCLI or IW or even the GUI, it doesn't prefer the, the better frequencies. So when 2.4, 5, and 6 gigahertz is enabled, at least on Cache OS, it seems to always jump to the 2.4 gigahertz. Maybe that's power saving related. It should jump to the 6 gigahertz band. And it's a kind of a pain to manually specify that. I think that the command line utilities should have like a, a, a frequency argument or a band argument where I can just say, yes, run on band 197, thank you. All right, for this test, this is on the five gigahertz band and this is on the six gigahertz band. And this uh, machine is able to maintain, it's, a, it's around one gigabit. It, it dips down a little below one gigabit a lot of the time, but our other connection ma can maintain 700 megabit. So 700 megabit simultaneously doing 1.1 gigabit or 1.5 to 1.6 gigabit when this client is by itself between the five and six gigahertz band. Two clients at the same time basically hammering the one tiny little access point and we're good to go. And that's the magic of the two by two by two. Also the 2.4 gigahertz, but I've disabled the 2.4 gigahertz right now because under that kind of a load, the clients would start steering to the 2.4 gigahertz connection and I didn't want that. I wanted those nice wide channel widths. It's gotta go fast. Where does that leave us overall? For $190, the ECW520 gives you a stable, affordable path into Wi-Fi 7 with enterprise leaning reliability. It's not a range monster. It's not for classrooms or stadiums or places where you have a ton of clients you wanna go fast, at least compared with Wi-Fi 6 or Wi-Fi 6E. And Wi-Fi 6E still makes more sense for those kinds of installations. But for like small office or power user, home user, that you, know, you want a reliable option that's fast, this is it. The only real caveat is heat and better placement matters. In my testing, I actually did a little bit better heat wise when it was mounted on a wall as opposed to the ceiling but you know, your mileage may vary. Right now, Wi-Fi 7, testing Wi-Fi 7 versus consumer jank, uh, this is one of the first options to emerge for Wi-Fi 7 that makes sense. But I'm gonna be back soon with the ECW, the 4x4x4, in a few weeks with a few more weeks of data. So stay tuned, I'm gonna hold final judgment until then. I'm, if you're considering Wi-Fi 7 or you're doing a Wi-Fi 7 upgrade or you've got something worse than Wi-Fi 6 not E, you might wanna think about upgrading now. Uh, oh, and if you do run into issues or curious behavior or anything you wanna share, hit us up in the forum. <laughs> there are refugees from other brands in the forum and uh, while nothing is perfect, it is interesting to compare notes, look at failure modes, hunt down bugs and see how we can improve the ecosystem. <laughs> you know, some brands use our forums to help bug hunt and find experiences that individual users are having. So that's always fun to see, a little horrifying, but if that means things get fixed faster, I'm on board for it. Overall, so far, my experience with these has been good, but I don't have a ton of experience under my belt yet, and so I've gotta do more testing. But overall, you can achieve greater than two and a half gigabit, or right at two and a half gigabit, with these access points, with a little bit of fine tuning and some uh, 
a creative engineering client side, which is uh, a lot of fun. I'm Wallace Level One. I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level One forums if you have any questions or if I miss anything.